So, um, so the weekend that we are, you know, we're here together, uh, and the work is is really uh, centred around this image. Um, so, this image uh, is described or, or named as Abracatashra, the thousand arm Abracatashra, and it might feel a bit kind of remote, a bit culturally kind of distant from our kind of, uh, our experience here and now. But um, uh, what I'm trying to do here is that uh, we're trying to draw out some of the meaning of why this image is so important, particularly as uh, Sangharakshita was really the founder of this uh, order, this movement, Sangharakshita uh, suggested that this image, in a way, represented the um, the activity of the order, the activity, the expression of the order. So it's yeah, it's certainly very important to us as an order. Yeah. And um, so it feels really important that we can find our own way into this image um, and try to articulate the values that are evoked here in this particular form, very specific form. So one of the risks of kind of engaging with any image or symbol is that uh, when we're trying to kind of come into relationship uh, as a, for it to be a guide to our practice, it can be really hard or, or maybe too easy to concretize and literalize the form. Because inevitably we are uh, we're kind of seeking stability and permanence and kind of frames to place our experience within. And um, what that does is, um, uh, through kind of engaging in that way, we're trying to kind of fix life in a very particular shape, in a very particular relationship, and we abandon the kind of fluidity of, of what it means, that, you know, the experience of actually being alive in now is actually very fluid, and we're constantly stepping into the unknown. But our tendency, our desire is to kind of fix and lock things down. So I guess what I'm asking is that we really try not to fix this image, fix this uh, you know, delightful, mysterious presence that we are trying to come into relationship to. But one of the problems when we literalise the image is that we can imagine that it's either something like a, when we hear more about the story of Abhateshwara, we can start to kind of see it almost like a, a fairy story, a kind of some sort of little narrative that, uh, that we can play with in our imagination. But... Um, that's really distorting or simplifying the mystery of Avakateshra. The other uh, pole or potential of, kind of looking at this image, exploring this image, is that we can see it as representing an actual transcendental figure that is communicating with us from the unconditioned, whatever that might be mean to us. So both of these uh, possibilities of either fixing it as, as some transcendental figure or fixing it as some kind of um, just an imaginative story really um, limits the power of the image, the power of Avakateshra to manifest directly within and through our shared embodiment without the filter of views. So I thought it might be helpful to, to 
just say a little bit about self and other power to begin with. Uh, and these terms may be hopefully familiar to you if you studied the Dharma at all. So the self power view is that we imagine that we are in some way control in control of change, that we can direct change, that we can choose to uh, create in the future some predetermined sense of, of ourselves. So we might, for instance, have a fantasy about becoming enlightened. Um, Usually, this fancy of enlightenment comes by imagining that we're going to make these efforts, we're going to um, use our own willpower to affect, um, affect our future. And in this scenario, we might imagine that Abhikateshra is simply an aspect of our own self, our own being, that is projected beyond the usual sense of ourself so that we can engage with these what are actually inner motivating forces, interact with them, but all the time kind of identifying them actually as being invisible in some way, living within us. So it's this rather sort of narcissistic bias in the relationship to uh, the figure that uh, conjures this, this kind of frame of blood and flesh as real, and this, Abhikateshra, is somehow only existing within our mind's eye, our heart, even our hands. So the alternative bias that in this dynamic between self and other is that um, we have other power. This is uh, often compounded by a bit of a naive grasp of uh, Dharma concept of no self. So in this distorted perception, we are non-existent and um, we ignore the precious gift of this, our flesh and blood, uh, for the sake of surrendering to, surrendering to other power. So in this other power view, we imagine that our own life is a uh, meaning derives from surrendering and serving the transcendental. So our own needs, our own drives, our own longings are somehow overridden as fabrications or intoxications of this deluded sense of selfhood. And it's this selfhood that is blocking our liberation. So in this kind of scenario, we are uh, uh, in this scenario, Avalokiteshvara represents that which is uh, real, and we, this imagined self, is ever trying to put itself in selfless service to the transcendental. So I thought it was important to try to sort of flag up those two kind of pitfalls, I guess, of, in, of engaging with uh, imagery and sim symbolism of Buddhism. And uh, well, one of the great things about Buddhism, it has this uh, turn the middle way. So we try to kind of dance in a way between imagining that it's all down to us or imagining it's all down to other power, the kind of transcendent. And um, so this comes to uh, the next point really, is how can we work, how can we play with this image? So, um, I'm gonna talk about two more Dharmic principles now. It's lucky you're lying down. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
again, uh, and um, talk about two underpinning Dharma principles that were taught by the Buddha, which hopefully will help us engage with the uh, image of Abhinavateshvara and the work that we're going to be doing this weekend. So the principles are the law of conditioned arising and the truth of Shinnita. So small topics to cover, you know, in a couple of minutes, but they feel important just to mention. So, <clears throat> so conditioned arising, that refers to the recognition, uh, this very particular recognition of the Buddha, that the underlying causes of the patterning of our experience, where every sensation, every appearance, it arises out of and fades back into a luminous ground of potentiality. And this arising and passing is dependent on a whole web of conditions. And we participate in this ongoing matrix of interwoven and ever-changing factors creating a unique, specific manifestation um, right here, in this moment. This moment, this manifestation, is fleeting, transitory, but it's dependent on a vast matrix of conditioning factors. And this, our individual and collective manifestation, is indivisible from and ever dancing out of an open ground of potentiality, luminous potentiality. And when we're in touch with that luminous ground, it seems that that facilitates these glimpses of potential. So, to complement condition arising, as I said, we talk about shunyata. Shunyata refers to that nothing has separate, uh, intrinsic, separate selfhood. We are all ultimately empty of anything that's fixed uh, uh, and uh, ongoing. We are simply the process. So there's no separate substantiality. We're simply manifesting and participating in this dance. So it's definitely not saying there's nothing here, because we don't have to look very far into our experience to recognize something's here. But it's just that we, I, you, me, uh, and Abba Tesra is an ongoing, unfolding process, an on going manifestation and dissolving is not um, there's nothing within this which is a fixed state so if we've been trying to live the Dharma for any time um, we will recognize that uh, the territory of relationships and the territory of being involved in Sangha is really such a vital and useful working ground that really invites us to just attend to conditions without trying to control outcomes. So I'm really pleased that many of us when we came, when we sort of just checked in earlier said, I haven't got a clue you know, what will come out this weekend, what will happen here in this space because that's really kind of vital, basic dharma, really, that actually we don't know what will happen. And we, we kind of foil ourselves by imagining we know what's going to happen, what's going to happen next. But actually, uh, we don't. And that's okay. In fact, it's vital. <laughs> so that kind of something about that it was really important that we recognise that um, 
this uh, relational life that we're exploring together here, this uh, kind of manifestation of uh, Sangha community, is inviting us to really test this truth of Shunyata so that we might, on a good day, really begin to let go of the grip that we're holding around a particular view of who we are, how we are, or who the other person is, who the other is, to sort of really uh, see if we can loosen that grip, that way of being or relating, and see through that releasing, that opening, whether we might be able to glimpse something fresh and vital emerging either within or through or amongst us here. And one of the things about Sangha community is it can be really painful and beautiful to recognise that these things that we've often clung on to with such tenacity uh, as individuals or as a Sangha, as we begin to discover them, beginning to dissolve, to uh, uh, change before our very eyes, our own hearts, it can be really difficult to manage those, that transition into the unknown. So we're, this weekend in a way is, is a training ground in developing our capacity to stay in that unknown space the unknowability of, the, of what we're following. And I think what's so important about that, it really helps us know that this image of Avatashra is not fixed in its meaning or effect. It's dancing, <coughs> although this is a static image. In fact, Avatashra is, is constantly dancing. It's in, a, it's in a fluid state, it's just like we've captured a moment as a dance, but really inviting you to recognise that this form is in constant movement, that what is manifesting through the hands is constantly being renewed uh, and um, dissolving and, and um, finding new forms in the moment. So let's just go back to, for those of you who don't know, just that there is a story around this figure. So the story is that there was a devout person who was vowing to alleviate suffering throughout Tibet. And um, this vow was made with all kind of seriousness and, and really trusted that uh, aspiration. And we could see this maybe as rather a kind of uh, young, inflated sense of our own aspirations, where we think we're going to, um, uh, in sort of opening phase uh, of this story, it really exemplifies that fantasy of uh, self-power, where we're going to save the world. I'm going to save the world. I'm going to do this by eliminating um, all my negative thoughts and actions and um, I'm going to act with complete positivity for the benefit of the world. So we might see this part of the story as recognising rather innocent, naive state of our younger self where anything and everything seems possible. And in some ways, we can kind of re regain that state at times. Um, but we can certainly kind of exist in it for long periods of time, where we try to reclaim this self-power through self-improvement, through willpower that we are going to change. And in doing that, we're creating a a not so subtle sense of separate selfhood, that it's I that is going to change the world, that I am going to be bringing an end of suffering for you. So there's that splitting out in some way from life. So in the story, however, 
unfortunately in the story, I could say, what happens to the person that's made that vow? He says, or they say, if for a moment I should have any doubt arises in me, may I shatter into a thousand pieces. So we could say that that is what happens to us all. That in some ways this is uh, all of us will experience this this moment of, of doubt or really huge waves of disorientation where we're thrown into the blackening which in uh, this particular tradition is described as spiritual death so we're scorched we're burned we're broken out of this white innocence of our life and it might be in these periods that we feel we imagine that something is being acted upon us that uh, life is doing us something to us and in which we have no control over it and i might be deluded but i think i believe that all of us are here today, all of us are on a journey because we've all been, been visited by doubt or despair, addiction, depression and darkness. And we could say that these are gifts, these are visitations that draw us out of our white, unconscious, unreflective innocence so that we have to descend into this lunar darkness. And in that darkness we're called to attend to these often repetitive or circling events, experiences. And we're invited, encouraged to attend to those experiences with kindness, with patience uh, and with care. So they're definitely not experiences to be abandoned, to be got rid of, but they're there to be picked up in love, into love and held so they may become the eyes of our hands. So in the shattering spiritual death, we are dragged below to begin to mind this uh, speechless, numb, numb, unseeing awe. The awe of our senses and unlearned habits that have served us in the past, but now are blindly gripping our body's responsiveness. So to bring this back to Abu Teshra, so this whole being was created through the love of Amitabha. So Amitabha was the figure that oversaw the kind of the breaking down, but then the gathering up of the, of the fragments and creating this beautiful form expression, expressing compassion moving out into the world. So we might <coughs> imagine that Amitabha, which is actually the, the top head of this whole figure, is Amitabha. And Amitabha, as you may know, is uh, symbolic, the symbolic form is red. So we might imagine or feel the presence of the reddening, the blushing love of Amitabha that flows down through the body, particularly our back. And so it's almost as if we can feel the soft hands of love on our backs which resources us to tend to our actual experience. These 
uh, this darkness, this unknowability. We tend to it by being resourced by the soft hands of love. And we do this work, this bringing attention to our experience, to discover and release into our private and our shared collective life together. We attend so that we don't abandon or banish those ancient parts that call out unexpectedly in the attempt to be reenacted. And we simply hold them, hold those uh, ancient parts in order to mine this precious lunar silver held within those experiences. So, coming back to Abu Teshra. We, as I said, we got Amitabha's love kind of brings this uh, being into this particular form. And this form only grows out of the shattering. It's, it's in a dynamic relationship to the shattering. So what we could do, or the way we might picture this weekend, is that what we are doing is questing or tenderly mining in the darkness of our bodies for the lunar silver to contribute to the animation of this constantly renewing precious living image. And the mining is done by leaning back, kind of feeling the support of, the, of this reddening softness of that and encouraging us to, or inviting us to bring kind awareness to our relational lives. And through that we recognise that the Kateshra doesn't just exist in our imagination or some transcendent realm, but it's actually flickering into and out of being, within, beyond and amongst us, in this collective field of awareness. And it's this quality of attention that we apply that gives rise to these unexpe uh, unexpected glimpses of silver, of meaning. So we have the pace, the time to track the silver threads gather the droplets of experience so we can bring attention to maybe the sparkle of dream images or the energy we notice in a particular word or a phrase, a gesture, an expression, all these things that we gather uh, amongst and between us. And the main thing is that we surrender the need to know and give up, try to conceptually understand, to kind of, uh, in some way, kind of step outside by understanding and more allowing ourselves simply to be in this uh, gathering and that allows all the silver threads, droplets, to coalesce into a collective mirror. We collectively act as a mirror for each other. And that mirror helps us see with our actual body senses. It opens the tender eye in our hand. And it's a way of discovering meaning, arising at this flickering luminosity that is the ground of this, all appearances. 
So as the image here suggests, this work is collective. This is collective work. We are one body, one mind. And we are all attending to the best of our capacity to attend to what is arising within and amongst us. And this attention is which uh, simply allows the next step, the next breath, the next glimpse to arise. So there's nothing that we have to find, there's nothing we have to achieve here. We're simply being open to what uh, wants to become visible, wants to be known. So Abhakateshra can only ever arise here. It's not an abstract presence. It actually can only ever arise in community, in relationship. So it's always Abhakateshra as a process of revelation, not some fixed fantasy of being any particular way. So all we have to do, all we have to do, is bra be brave enough to love and to mind the action rather than the wished for. We simply mind what is here with care, with love. Noticing that wished for, but that being part of the actual, but the real thing is what is actually alive in us. And in this act, uh, through this process, hopefully we can build faith in trusting the engaged, open, lucid awareness brought to the actual is sufficient. It's as if, well I quite like, I don't know why I like this word, we blush this kind of reddening that happens when there's a, a motion that we are kind of maybe unfamiliar with or seems kind of slightly uh, unusual. We blush into being which activates this lunar light within the body so that we can see with greater clarity the ancient binds that we all carry in the body. And also we notice alongside those binds our natural responsiveness. And this combination of working with the binds and responsiveness are sufficient conditions to give rise to the eyes in our hands as we touch and are touched, animating the living image of Abhakateshra, making liberation, the potential of liberation and the alleviation of suffering so close, so close in. This is the work for this weekend. Maybe so.